So very warm welcome to the eighth uh, episode of Next Gen Mock Examination. And as this program is uh, gaining a lot of uh, interest and popularity, uh, we are taking a, a long case today, that is Wilms Tumor. And uh, we have with us two eminent people of the country. Uh, both of them need no introduction, Dr. Deepak Ghosh from Kolkata and Dr. Yogesh Sareen from New Delhi. Our presenter today is uh, Dr. Debelina Karmakar, and uh, she is going to present this case. This is going to be a 40 minute, 45 minute session. After that, we will have a short quiz, which will be conducted by Dr. Manish. So hand, I hand over uh, to Dr. Debelina. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my patient is a three-year-old male child. The informant was mother who is a reliable source. The child presented with a painless mass in the left side of the abdomen for the last two months. The child was the child was apparently well till two months back. The mother noticed a mass in the left side of the abdomen of the child two months back while bathing the child. The mass has increased in size. There has been no pain associated with the mass. The child was taken to a local physician where he was investigated and further referred to a hospital. There is no history of trauma, acute illness in the past, no history of associated pain with the swelling, no history of blood in the urine, no history, no history of I'm sudden sorry. increase in size of the swelling or decrease in size of the swelling after mixturation. There is no history of fever, anorexia, weight loss. There is no history of chronic cough, respiratory distress, recurrent chest infection or hemoptysis. There is no history of pain in the chest or any pain. No history of jaundice, no history of loose tools, paraplegia, abnormal eye movements or abnormal body postures. No history of any bleeding manifestation or bruising. There is no history of any other swelling in the abdomen or in the groin. The child has normal bowel and bladder habits. Uh, coming to perinatal history, the antenatal scans were normal for the mother. She had no history of any drug in the during pregnancy. The child was delivered by normal vaginal delivery at full term. Uh, Adequate for um, age, for gestational age. He cried immediately after birth and there was no history of any NICU state. He is the first born of a non consanguineous marriage. There is no history of any malignancy, renal disease or growth problems in the family. He has been immunized as per age uh, with normal development. Uh, there has been no previous history of hospitalization in the past. Coming to general examination. Should I proceed, sir? Uh, could you go go back two slides where you describe the history? Yes, sir. Uh, one is that the mother noticed some small size and then big, it became bigger. So did she describe how much to how much? I mean... Uh, it was very subjective, sir. She explained with her hands. That's why I did not include that in the history. Can you, can you move uh, to the... But the... Yes, sir. Can you move to the next slide? Yes, sir. So what all have you kind of tried to rule out on history for this patient in uh, saying, telling all this? Yes, sir. Uh, so the first point, trauma. Uh, sudden increase in size of the swelling, though there is no associated pain, might be because of trauma due to some kind of hemorrhage in, the, uh, in that area. Uh, acute illness uh, might be might might lead to uh, abscess formation in some organ in that area. The pain, uh, blood in the urine, uh, blood in the urine that is immature. Since it is mass, hello. Since it is a mass in the left. Mute yourself. Since it is a mass. Since it's a mass in the left hand, I'm considering that this is a mass arising from the kidney. So I have included hematuria because that is one of the associations with a renal mass. Sudden increase in size of the swelling might be due to uh, hemorrhage inside the mass or uh, sudden malignant uh, associated with any kind of malignancy. Uh, decrease in size of the swelling of maturation might be seen in a hydronephrosis. Fever, anorexia, weight loss are all constitutional symptoms of malignancy, but 
more seen, anorexia and weight loss are seen more with neuroblastomas. Chronic cough, respiratory distress uh, are can be seen with lung metastasis. Uh, pain in the chest, again, seen in lung metastasis. Bony pain might be due to bony metastasis. Jaundice might be uh, due to both uh, liver metastasis or some other association uh, associated abnormalities of the liver. Loose tools, paraplegia, abnormal eye movements, and abnormal body posturing all are um, uh, direct invasion symptoms, invasive symptoms or paraneuroblastic symptoms of neuroblastoma. Leading manifestation of bruising might be seen both in cases of wind tumor and also in cases of uh, hepatic derangements because of diffuse hepatic metastasis. Any other swelling in the abdomen might be. Um, uh, a secondary malignancy or lymph node swelling or, and swelling in the groin is seen. Uh, I've tried to rule out varicocele in case of a left-sided energy. Okay, so you have kept Wim's tumor as one of your DD, isn't it? Uh, sir, could you please repeat? I could not hear. You have <laughs> Wim's tumor as one of your DDs, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. So well, in that case, you would need to also mention some of the symptoms that would rule out syndromic Wim's tumor. Yes, sir. Um, I have mentioned all that in the examination part. I must have mentioned, should have mentioned in the history. And secondly, when we talk about... Bone, I've included that in the examination. Yeah. So, secondly, when we talk about bone pain, bone pain is a little yeah. feature right. which other children could tell. Right. So, you yeah. can, could you all mute yourself, please? When we talk about neuroblastoma, usually a smaller child with stage 4 disease, as they usually come with, will have difficulty in walking. They were walking normally and they will stop walking. Bone pains as such, they may not mention. Let's go on to your examination. Community general examination. The child was examined in a well-lit room in a warm setting with the mother's permission. He is alert, active and playful. He has normal faces with no abnormality of the iris, that is no aniridia, no asymmetric growth is seen in the body. He is well hydrated with optimal nutrition. There is no pallor, icterial, cyanosis, clubbing, or any fetal edema. No bony swelling or venous prominence is seen over the body. There are no skin changes seen. No signs of premature puberty. His BP is 80 by 50 uh, millimeter mercury, and the child was not crying while the BP was recorded. The pulse rate was 100 beats per minute. The weight and height are uh, within normal uh, standards. Uh, please mute yourself um, or raise hands and we'll let you speak. Uh, how did you find that this patient has no asymmetric growth? Uh, I assess the length and girth of his limbs uh, and compared them uh, with the contralateral side. So what all words did you measure? Girth at the level of uh, uh, girth of the thigh at the midpoint of the trochanter and the um, tub uh, tibial tuberosity. And also cuff the girth of the cuff at the maximum uh, level of maximum girth. Maximum thickness. What about upper limb? Upper limb? Uh, upper limb I also measured at the midpoint of the humerus uh, of the arm and also midpoint. So what are the, uh, of the bony, bony landmarks there to measure uh, which is the midpoint? For the, for the arm, for the arm, it was the midpoint of the um, through me another olecranon. Okay, go on. Next. I did not actually measure the forearm, but only the arm. Yeah, go on. Next slide. Coming to abdominal examination, 
on inspection, the abdomen was protuberant with centrally placed everted umbilicus. There was no scar, pigmentation, or venous prominence seen. There are marks is visible in the left flank involving the left lumbar region and extending into the left hypochondrium, left uh, uh, epigastrium, umbilical regions. It is globular in shape. The surface of the mask seems to be smooth and medially it seems not to cross the midline. It does not move with respiration. The left renal angle is full. No other visible swelling is seen in the abdomen. There is no visible peristalsis or pulsatile movement. The genitalia seems to be normal with bilateral descended testes. There is no visible uh, swelling in the groin. Is this inspection or is it... Yeah. So, uh, how did you this see that the surface of mass is smooth on inspection? Um, or that it uh, the midline? From the side, from this. Uh, so, it was a. It is which are uh, basically uh, for palpation. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say. Next. Okay. Next slide. Yeah. Coming to palpation. There is. There is no superficial tenderness present. Temperature is normal over and equal over all the quadrants. There is a 10, uh, approximately 10 into 15 centimeter mass in the left lumbar region, extending into the left hypochondrium, epigastrium, umbilical region, and also part of the left iliac fossa. The mass just reaches the midline, but does not cross the midline. Fingers could not be insinuated between the mass and the left costal margin. The mass was globular in shape, non tender. Part in consistency. Gaurav Sahib, please. Has smooth surface please. and has rounded. Uh, it does not move with respiration. It is bimanually palpable but non ballotable The left renal angle is full. It is non tender and also retroperitoneal in position. The harnial orifice is of three. The genitalia is normal. Dr. Uh, Tabolina, just show me this yes. previous slide. Previous one. Do you expect that, that this much movement? Yeah, I could not. Next hear slide. You. Next slide. Next slide. The balloon. I want to make it. Yes, Do, you expect, that, do you expect that this slide should move with respiration or what? Such similar swelling as there, which can move with respiration. Uh, um, and another thing is, mass... is retroperitoneal. Do you have a correlation yes, sir, like that? Sorry. I cannot hear you, sir. So, could you please repeat? Just you are telling to... it. Yeah, go on. You are telling it to be retroperitoneal, and you are telling it it is not, in move, not moving with respiration. Yes, do you have a correlation with this? Yes, sir. The tropical swelling usually doesn't move with respiration. Uh, sir, usually. But there can be other swellings also in the similar. Yes, sir. Which yes, can, sir. What are the swellings that can move with respiration? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, any any swelling that is in contact with the diaphragm will move with respiration. Yes. So in the left uh, side of the abdomen. A splenic mass or a mass uh, from the left colon can move with respiration. But retroperitoneal structures usually does not move with respiration because they are uh, in a contained in a tight place. Have you checked this boy in knee elbow position or some other way you have done it? Uh, I have not used a knee elbow position. I have asked the mother to hold the child prone on, you know, on her hands like this, and have tried to palpate the mass. The mass was not uh, um, palpit. It, it became less palpable uh, on prone position. Hence, I uh, considered it to be a retroperitoneal mass. Another thing is, you have told it is bimanually palpable. Is there a difference between bimanually palpable and balatable, non balatable? <laughs> Uh, so usually a mass, if it is bimanually palpable, it will be very large. So balotability won't be present because balotability is considered when a smaller mass is pushed with one hand and can be felt with the other hand. 
They will know. He's just trying to say that uh, if it is a retroperitoneal large mass, then you don't need to talk about the respiration. But if it is bimineral palpable, then you don't need to talk about the bilateral. Uh, margin rounded. I think we should talk about margins either defined or ill-defined. You know, rounded. Um, okay, you used it, so all right. But uh, whether they are well defined all around or they are not well defined. Yeah. So can we go on to the next okay. slide? <laughs> Cardiac orifice is a free genitalia is normal. Both the testes were palpable in the scrotum. There was no other swelling in the left hemiscrotum. Liver, uh, lower margin of the liver was palpable, just two centimeter below the right costal margin in the mid clavicular line. Um, there was no other body swelling or tenderness. The occasion of the swelling was dull. There was no shifting dullness of fluid still. Uh, auscultation, uh, there was no brew over the mass on auscultation, and there was normal. Intestinal peristaltic sound present in the rest of the abdomen. A uh, CBS examination and respiratory examination were essentially normal. The spine did not have any abnormal swelling or tenderness. Uh, did you look for bowel sounds? Uh, what's the listening post of abdomen? Sir, uh, I listened for the bowel sound in the right ileus fossa. Go on. Next slide. So to summarize, uh, so to summarize, my patient is a three-year-old, well-preserved, non-syndromic male child who presented with a solitary, firm, painless, well-defined, bimanually palpable, non-tender mass in the left flank with no evidence of metastasis. Uh, considering that, considering the age, the clinical symptom, and the history. I uh, most probably this is a neoplastic mass arising from the left kidney, most probably a worm's tumor of the left side. I'm I'm okay with that. Fine. So and now are you going to show us uh, how did you prove um, your diagnosis, or you stop here? How was it? So you are asking me how to proceed. No, no. Are, are you going to stop your slides here or are you going to show us some investigations to show that you were right on your diagnosis? So I will Sir, before I will that, uh, should we discuss a bit about the differential diagnosis? Yes. What she is thinking? What she is thinking? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm one of those guys who believe that if a student could actually tell very well that you know most of the differential diagnosis have been ruled out, then... Yes. Every patient should not have a differential diagnosis of three, one, two, three. I mean, I'm very happy if she could present in a way that she convinces me that it's a renal mass. That's and fine. That's fine. Let's, Let's move on to the next investigation. Is she's ruled out your neuroblastoma for you uh, for examination. And she's ruled out a couple of other things, which like hydnephrosis. I mean, for the sake of saying them here, which she has anyway ruled out, so I, I I didn't insist on that. Go on. Uh, I just okay. Um. So this is the end of my slide. If you want to see the investigations, I have them here. But, uh, yeah. Go on. Uh, should I proceed, sir, with the with yes, um. Sir. Yes, okay. with my request okay. to others to mute yourself or raise your hand and then we'll let you get, get in. Yeah, go on. As they are joining, so, um, they, are, they are unmute. So I'm constantly taking care of that. I'm muting them. So please don't yes. worry. Go on. Uh, uh, so to proceed with this presentation, I would like to do some investigations to diagnose, stage the disease and stratify according uh, for uh, risk stratification and then finally move ahead with the management. Uh, to diagnose the patient, I would like first like to do an ultrasound uh, uh, chest x-ray and an uh, x-ray of the abdomen in a direct posture and an ultrasound of the whole abdomen with a color dog. You have those with you? I don't have the X-rays with me, but I have the ultrasonography. But the ultrasonography was done outside before referral, and we did not repeat it. Uh, it the showed a large. 
yes sir go on ha it showed a large retroperitoneal multifloculated mass in the left renal fossa extending to the midline likely arising from the lower pole of the kidney left kidney with internal vascularity uh, it did not mention anything about um, it did not mention anything else and the, it showed that the right kidney was normal all right so you, the the slide previous to it can we go on to that yes sir let's talk about this all the all the labs that we did uh, that is the um, complete hemogram the rft lft ptinr all were normal and the urine routine examination also was normal and did not have any uh, hematuria so what is the abnormality you see in a proportion of patients with wims tumor <laughs> with in hospital and the one there okay sir um wims tumor patient usually are well preserved but if the child has got microscopic or macroscopic hematuria there might be um, anemia present but total count usually is normal Not beyond uh, that okay um the hemoglobin them yes beyond hemoglobin is there any hematological abnormality you should look for and it is present in a certain proportion of patients with wims tumor sir abnormal um, pt aptt uh i'll give profile. i'll give you a hint It starts with V. Yes, sir. Von Willebrand disease. So that will lead to an abnormal APTT. Ah, uh, it, so, it was normal for my patient. So what are the investigations? The if you if you have a, a normal um, APPT, would you stop at that, or will you do some tests? Or uh, if it had been abnormal, would you do then some tests? Okay, we'll come back to this later. Let's go on to your two slides down the lane. Yeah, stop here. So, uh, the child uh, had a normal urea creatinine. So, with that report, we proceeded with a CECT of the whole abdomen and thorax. Uh, these are few of the slides. So, the one in, image in what cases. do you think with a unilateral wims tumor also patient could have abnormal uh if it is a solitary tumor with uh, very little normal parent time of present again this is a non syndrome is it any way related to functioning renal parenchyma they will you know yes sir so if less than one third renal parenchyma is present the uh, kft might be not abnormal no no i i'll give a hint uh, not in this case but if it had been a syndromic wims tumor okay Syndromic patients like uh, Dennis Dras association with Dennis Dras syndrome or uh, WAGR syndrome or Fraser Fraser uh, syndrome might have abnormal um, renal function tests because they have associated renal problems like uh, mesangial sclerosis in case of Dennis Dras focal Does sclerosis. Does Wagner also have a problem? Do, do you do you? It, Does Wagner also have a problem? Uh, WHR might have. Uh, uh, no, usually they don't have renal problem on at uh, presentation, but might have late onset renal failure. So Dennis Trash and Fraser is right. So what abnormality is there in the chromosomes in these two particular, or if you include Wagner also? conditions uh all of all of these are associated with abnormalities in the wt1 gene that is present in the 11 p13 location uh, lo uh, locus 
So if somebody no, says one kidney is abnormal, rest is okay, still you need to be knowing that this syndromic Wim's tumor may still have abnormal KFT. So one need to be very careful about that. Let's talk about the CT first. The right, the image on the right uh, top corner, that is the axial CT, we can see uh, this is a non-contrast CT and we can see that there is no associate, there is a, uh, there is a large mass involving the left side of the uh, left flank and there is no associated calcification in this um, uh, non-contrast CT. On contrast enhancement, on contrast enhancement, that is this uh, large image in the middle, we can see that there is a well-circumscribed heterogeneous mass involving the left side of the abdomen. Uh, it has it has mostly solid components, but there are a few um, cystic components present in the middle. Uh, it is seen to be reaching the midline and compressing the bowel to the opposite side. Um, the uh, liver does not ha seem to have any kind of um, metastatic nodules. The lung field also seems to be free. The image in the right lower corner, here we can see that the vessels are pushed a bit towards the opposite side, but they are not encased by the tumor. And on the image in the left lower corner, uh, here we can see that the Tumor has actually arisen from the lower pole of the left kidney and a, a, quite a large portion of the left kidney has got normal parenchyma left in the upper pole. Yeah, that's, that's very important for somebody like me who believes in doing NSS in unilateral Wim's tumor. I mean, this will be an ideal case for NSS and unilateral Wim's tumor. But I will not go into it because not many people kind of do it. I mean, believing, if you read literature, you would. Okay, tell me now about the two cooperative trials. What do they say? Whether we should do CCT or some other imaging? CCT mm -hmm. uh, uh, whole of is recommended by both the trials, but the confusion comes regarding the CT thorax. Um, I think NWT is a COG group. They want no, us no. to. No, 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 no. Both the cooperative trials now talk about contrast enhanced MRI, okay, as regards the abdomen part is concerned. But as regards the chest, they feel that non contrast CT scan should be done. But MRI has its own issues about anesthesia, this, this, that, and everything. So that is why we continue to do CCT, which is acceptable. But if you wish to do MRI abdomen, which I see often now in Delhi, then you must first do CCT scan, um, a, a, sorry, non-contrast CT scan of the chest, and then followed by MRI, because MRI may actually need anesthesia, which may need some amount of atelectasis. And if somebody is smart enough to do the non-contrast CT scan of the thorax on the same day, then the ensuing the, 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 the anesthesia that is given oh, yes. for may cause some amount of atelectasis. So you may miss a metastasis on the lower half of the lung. So first do a non-contrast CT and then do MRI abdomen. But till we have those issues about, you know, having anesthesia, this, that, CCT is perfectly okay. So it's very important that you mentioned that at least half of the kidney of this patient, upper half is perfectly okay, which probably can be saved. Can we go on to the next slide, please? Uh, this is my last slide. So So uh, for this child, in, in my institution, we follow the SIO protocol after discussion with the tumor board. So uh, our radiotherapy department requires a pre-chemo pre biopsy for all our patients. 
so we went ahead with the immediate sukar babsi for this child which reported a triphasic wills tumor Yeah. With this report, we went ahead. With this report, we went ahead with pre-operative chemotherapy uh, for uh, four weeks with vincristine and dactinomycin. And uh, after six weeks, we went went ahead with surgery. We did a you, you'd give a radical. Six weeks, you give six weeks of chemotherapy? No, no, no. So sorry, four weeks, four weeks, six weeks for medicine. Four when, weeks. Okay. When did you? Biopsy report on two cut came after the patient was admitted. Uh, so, so uh, could you repeat, please? The 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 patient the patient came uh, with the uh, pre-op uh, uh, with a CCT scan and did you do this biopsy uh, from OPD and how many days did it take to for this biopsy to come back? Uh, so we did the biopsy. Um, we usually admit the child, do the biopsy, and send the child back because in a hospital the biopsy takes around fourteen days to come. So that is a problem. If you believe yes. in doing a preoperative biopsies, then your pathologist must give that biopsy within three to five days. Trust me, I worked abroad because I went to so many centers just to learn about Wim's tumor. And the biopsy would be given the same day. I'm talking about the histopathological specimen. Two-cut biopsy should not take more than four hours, actually. It is just that you have to pile on them and not wait for two weeks just to have a biopsy report, which anyway you are going to go ahead and do. The... Now, what are your reasons of doing biopsy? I also do biopsy, by the way, but I want to know theoretically, what are your reasons? of doing biopsy on such patients when you're following a psyop anyway. Mm. Because UKCCG, uh, which has been doing it since 1990s, have now joined hands with psyop and the first recruitment under umbrella protocol was done in 2019. And now they believe that there are only some set of patients which need a two-cut biopsy. And um, early I should be asking that question to you. So what does the psyop say now? Which are the, these patients which should have biopsies done? Okay. Uh, according to recent our protocol, a pre-chemo biopsy is not long, no, uh, it's not mandated anymore. Uh, no, 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 it's never mandated. Uh, no, 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 no. It was never mandated in psyop, okay? UK CCG used to routinely do it. It's not mandated. Now, no, no, no. It, it was never done, right? It was never done. But there were a lot of criticism that you may do benign, you may do non wim tumors, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. So they, now they have worked out some indications of doing trickle biopsy. And the same indications have been picked up by UKCCG. So now UKCCG does not do it, you know, mandatory trickle biopsy on every patient. But we still do it. I, I still do it. What are your reasons for doing a trickle biopsy in every patient? So, uh, to look for uh, the blastoma component, whether it's a monophasic, to rule out high risk tumors like uh, monophasic blastoma tumors, to look for anaplasia. You are, you are doing SEOP, right? So, risk stratification yes, in SEOP is done after chemotherapy is done and surgery is over, right? So, you can't talk about but your reason to... is not right. Yes, sir. So, to rule out other uh, like benign lesions or other types of renal tumors. No, no. Like in case That's of. I'm repeatedly saying, less... you and Santosh Mahalik has put it in the notes that there are now clear cut indications given by SAP. You should know there are at least five different types of indications where you would do trip cut biopsy, not others. Yeah. Right? Uh, one of them could be that the age is more than seven years. If the age is less than six months, but it's got either unrefractable tumor or stage four, then there are a lot of other this thing, biochemical, this thing like uh, your um, uh, calcium levels are very high. There are a lot of things that need to be seen, which are seen more in the new non vegetarian tumor. The only reasons we Indians can talk about is that in the Southeast Asia, in like Vietnam, uh, South Korea, India, 
we have a higher incidence of non-Wilms renal tumors. We had incidence about about 20% or so, whereas non-Wilms renal tumors will reflect only about 5% in Western countries. So we have a higher chunk of non-Wilms renal tumor, which are not going to be treated with the chemotherapy that suggested for Wilms tumor. That's why we do non-Wilms renal tumor. But if you're doing biopsy, then you cannot waste two weeks of therapy just to wait for that biopsy. That you have to cut down. You have to talk to the histopathologist and get it down to at least three to five days. You should have a biopsy on. Okay. Now, what chemotherapy did you get? I uh, gave a uh, three drug regimen that is uh, Vintristin, Daphnomacin, and Doxy. Why three drug? Doctor Like is I'm it... not talking about I'm not talking about the preoperative chemo. I'm not okay. you okay. okay. I'm talking about the preoperative chemo. We then come to surgery okay. and surgical. Two drugs. Yes, sorry, sir. Preoperative chemo was done with Vincristian and Aphromycin. Two for drugs four weeks. For how four weeks. And when was the surgery four done? Weeks. When was the surgery done? Uh I think just seven days after uh, chemo. Right. Well, let's talk about your surgical specimen. There was a you talk about. Yeah. Let's talk about the surgical specimen that you talk about. Uh, it is. So could you please repeat the question? Like, Why don't you read from your slide about the surgical specimen? Uh, surgical specimen. So a uh, radical nephrohydratectomy was done with lymph node sampling. We did not do a nephron sparing surgery. So how many lymph nodes did you remove? Hello. Your slide says six. Why not seven? Yes, sir. Um, Why not the seven? It should have been seven. Yeah. Uh, should have been seven. The protocol so is seven. Which, which all lymph nodes were removed? In this case, Case, sir, uh, pre -hyal uh, the hyalur lymph nodes, the suprahyalur, infrahyalur, um, or paraortic lymph nodes, the auto cable lymph node was taken out, uh, and um, so what, lymph what, nodes. what is what is the sentinel lymph node for Wim's tumor? Sir, hyalur lymph nodes, suprahyal, no. uh, depending like this is a low. Pole tumor, so yeah. infrahyalur. Depending on nothing, it's a aorta cable. I mean, there's, there's nothing like upper pole is different, lower pole is different. Aorta cable nodes have to be removed. I mean, they are the sentinel nodes that must be removed. And your surgical specimen says Wim's tumor favorable histology. That that's a big problem there. We following SIOP, isn't it? Then we're going to describe yes. the biopsy report as SIOP. Favorable, yes. unfavorable is the way we describe the tumor in COG, COG protocol. and protocol. not yes. here. So here we need to talk about staging, which is you already written local stage two. Um, and then uh, we need to talk about uh, the risk risk stratification. So SIOPSIT is Triop risk stratification is done with histology, staging um, the post-operative chemotherapeutic changes. Uh, yeah, CAC. So chemotherapy-induced changes is that. So what I'm trying to say is that when you write favorable histology, especially if you're given a pre-op chemotherapy, that's not done. That's not done. Then yes. we will talk about risk stratification. By the way, even in COG, there is a risk stratification. But traditionally, the specimen, we still talk about favorable and unfavorable histology if we do upfront surgery. But if you do upfront chemotherapy as in done in SIOP, then you don't write favorable histology. Then you tell me the risk stratification. And what's the risk stratification here? Uh, risk this is all about intermediate tumor, according to this higher protocol. Right. Because it's so it the triphasic tumor. Right. So it is, it is intermediate risk. So when we talk about intermediate risk, yes, you also mention the type of, of Wim's tumor. By the way, when we talk about COG, we talk about Wim's tumor predominant, you know, whatever predominant. 
And here we talk about type. So what type of tumor was this? This is a mixed, mixed Wilms tumor. Okay, what do you understand by regressive Wilms tumor? What do you mean by regressive Wilms tumor? A uh, regressive Wilms tumor will be uh, when there is uh, less, uh, more than 66% non-viable tumor present or less good, than 500 good. ml. Uh, very good, very tumor. good, very good. So tell me, when we talk about margins, what is now accepted margin for Wim's tumor? One centimeter. Oh, one centimeter. No, 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 no. It's actually one millimeter. one millimeter. It's not mentioned. One millimeter, one millimeter. One millimeter, yeah. not one, one centimeter. So it's a stage sorry, two tumor. Sorry. So it's an intermediate stage two tumor. Now what chemotherapy would you give? Uh... Uh, three drug regimen chemotherapy with again you're wrong tactin. again you're wrong stage two intermediate risk does not need the doxorubicin it just needs two drugs yes sir. It does not need the third drug okay. even in stage three intermediate risk where it is um either epithelial or either stromal, we do not add doxorubicin even in stage 3 in SEOP. So, giving a third drug to this patient in local stage 2 is not justifiable. Doxorubicin must not be given to stage 2 patients. Unless okay, you are talking about high-risk patients. Now tell me the classification of risk stratification in COG, please. Uh, COG risk stratification is done with the help of histology, which is based on presence no, no, of. Tell, first, uh, tell me the, uh, the risk strata. Just the, no, no, just mention the strata to me. How many types? Risk strata. Uh, favorable, histo favorable histology, and after that, unfavorable histology. I've got two types. Nobody, that no, is, buddy, uh, that's uh, histopathology. I'm talking about risk stratification and COG. Yes, sir. Uh, very low risk. No, that is also. Yes, yes. Very low risk, low risk. Very low risk. Uh, very low risk, low risk, stranded risk, and high risk. Good, very good. Fantastic. All right. So tell me what is very low risk? Very low risk tumors, according to COG protocol, is less than two years of age, less than 550 grams tumor. Stage one disease with uh, loss of heterozygosity negative. That's good, very good. And what is low risk Wim's tumor? Low, low risk Wim's tumor is uh, stage one, favor stage one and stage two febrile histology, uh, LOH negative. Provided the features above are not there. Suppose the tumor is more than 550 grams. Suppose the patient age is more than two years. That Then it will move on yes, to sir. the low risk. More than two years, yes. Sir. And what about if LH is positive? Low risk, yes. Sir. If, what about if LH uh, is positive? Uh, sir, uh, stage one favorable histology, LH positive is still, I think, low risk. Yes, and stage absolutely two, right. stage so tell me, tell me now. We, we talk about LOH on a two chromosomes. So which one are we talking? Are we talking about? Can you both, both one P and sixteen? P. Very nice, very good, very good, fantastic. That that's very nice to hear from you. So I think I have most of the time has been exhausted. That's why I give it over to uh, Professor Vikesh Agarwal, and then probably. Uh, Dr. Um, Manish Patak would come in. Dr. Uh, Deepak Ghosh, do you have any other questions? Uh, to uh, Sarin, sir, uh, I just want to mention that if there is uh, there is LOH positive, then usually it is placed in the group 
three and four favorable histology also goes in the high risk group. So in this case, there is a diagnostic dilemma. What protocol should we give? We should go on with the three drug regime and uh, no, no. What is the no, 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 no. What is the diagnostic dilemma here? Sir, sir, in case of stage three or four favorable histology with no, no, no. loss so of the heterogeneity. Problem, the, 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 Dr. Ghosh, the problem is when we have given pre-op chemotherapy, we're not talking about COG and LOH and all that yet. You know, SIOP has not included the LOH and all that right now. I mean, I mean, you got to understand that we must follow. Once we start SIOP, we must follow SIOP, right? So if we have given a preoperative chemotherapy, we're not going to talk about favorable histology. We are just going to talk about intermediate risk and stage two. And we're going to give chemotherapy accordingly. That's it. So we will not get into the the if 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 if, if it had been a, a upfront surgery, then I would have discussed this whole thing very very differently. In another five years, trust me, both COG or ten years maybe both COG and SEOP would be almost very very similar. We want to include all this LOH business and Q1 gain and all that. So both both of these protocols will be very similar uh, in coming times. So just okay. now you don't need to give doxorubicin whatsoever. No, even stage two and three, if it is less than 550 grams and if it is epithelial stromal, you don't give uh, uh, doxorubicin. No, if there is a um, retroperitoneal rupture preoperatively, you don't give, don't, don't step up uh, chemotherapy at all. If the patient has got stage four disease, but local stage is one or two, you do not uh, upstage and um, I mean, uh, at least upstage from the point of view, the flank radiotherapy, you don't give flank radiotherapy. You just give higher chemotherapy, but no flank radiotherapy. So there are a few things that we must understand very, very clearly. And this double has done a fabulous job and I must clap for her. I have a question to both of you, Dr. Ghosh and Dr. Sarin, sir. Uh, it's a very like... Um, Postgraduate level question. If someone, uh, some unit is following an NWTS protocol, and if you outrightly uh, on imaging find a tumor which is stage three tumor having the like a local invasion crossing the midline, so would you switch over to a SIOP protocol or still explore? Uh, and does this come under protocol violation? What is your opinion about that? Oh, all right. So I, I'll try to correct you, Vikesh. Here is that. You don't say stage three when you have not done surgery. Surgery, there is no staging before the surgery. Okay. You may say near nodes are there, uh, the significant nodes are there or not, uh, but that's perfectly okay. The only thing that works in COG is it is surgeon dependent. If the surgeon says this patient is unresectable tumor, mm -hmm. you may say it's unresectable, I may say resectable. That's different. But you are also right and I'm also right. Okay. So by your standards, by your surgical expertise, if you think it is an unresectable tumor, you can just go ahead and do preoperative chemotherapy and then decide later. The difference yeah, please. and SIOP is that they give, they give more drugs for longer time. All right. Now, what drugs? They, they give actually two plus two drugs. I mean, they alternate and they can give it to up to nine weeks and even up to 12 weeks if they think the patient has got unresectable tumor. This is COG. Uh, but when we talk about SEOP, we have very, very clear uh, indications how much chemo to be given and what to be given. I mean, it's metastatic, what to be given. So perfectly okay. This patient was ideal for NSS, actually. Mahalik, you, you're part of that game with me, which you have not played. Yes, sir, I do agree also. This is ideal for NSS. Yeah, this ideal, ideal for NSS. NSS. And I have got now at least 12 patients for from follow-up with follow up as long as five years of age. None of them has ever had recurrence and I have 100% EFS and 100% overall survivals for five years now for at least eight patients. So one, a, fact, one fact I would like to add, which is contrary to your point of view, it is not my opinion, but Japanese yeah. Society of yeah. 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 have devised the yeah. 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 Actually.
So this is Japanese Society of Pediatric Surgeons, which has uh, insisted upon their uh, devised uh, protocol, which is between NWTS and PSYOP, and they follow image-based staging also. This is just for uh, academic information for all the postgraduates. No, no, no. That no the, the, their articles published in the articles published in 1980s and 1990s, and isolated articles available there, where um, uh, they used to do this such kind of staging. But I remember the year 2008, we were in um, um, SOP meeting um, in uh, Germany, and one of our own uh, Indian pediatric surgeon of repute, she was presenting a paper, and uh, the the person who was chairing the session was my own boss, where I got trained in Saint Jude's, and he appreciated the paper, and I got up and I, you know, blasted the paper uh, totally because uh, uh, you can't talk about preoperative staging uh, really. So we both most of us follow only SIOP and COG. So let's not say this that uh, yeah, you know preoperatively but to tell you the truth some groups are kind of now trying to kind of evolve that kind of imaging but it's not still accepted at all and yeah. if you talk about japanese even indians have now come out uh, with recommendations in 2017 which are published in indian general pediatrics i mean we just can't talk about all the, um, basically if you were know about umbrical umbrella protocols and the, the recent cog aaron protocols i think good enough and yes. I think Dablana has done a great job. Yeah, she has done a great job. And for all practical and exam purposes, you, you should always mention what is correct in the evidence-based medicine. Uh, Dablana, now it's your turn yes, to face the next part of the show that is a rapid-fire round on Williams Tumor, which is uh, uh, going to be presented by Dr. Mani, Manish Pathak. I will make him admin. Just let me find out where he's. Yeah, mute, unmute yourself. Yeah. Now. yeah. Yeah. Now you co host, you can share the screen. Thank you, Dr. Vikesh. Uh, thank you, Professor Sarin, sir. Uh, it was an excellent discussion, and most of the part has already been discussed. So we will just be, you know, re revising whatever has been discussed. And by the MCQ, we will try to, uh, has been discussed already. So. Are you able to share your screen? So, Baba ko Is it visible now? Yeah, it is visible. Just make it full screen. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, Dr. Debolina, this is the first question. Uh, you just read it out. Sir, uh, actually, I cannot. Okay, now I can see. Thank you. What is the most? What is the most common histologic diagnosis of pediatric renal tumor in less than three months? Congenital mesoblastic nephroma. Yeah. So uh, good. So this is uh, what means in less than till less than one year of age, up to 50% of the patients uh, with the renal tumors are congenital mesoblastic nephroma. And then uh, means yes. till three months of age, this is the most common the diagnosis. Most common. What about rhabdoid tumor of kidney? Means till what age usually we see? What is the most common rhabdoid age? Rhabdoid tumor in the first one year of life? Yeah. Creosal sarcoma. Um, shares the same age group as Wilms tumor around one to four years and Wilms tumor of course one to four years yeah one okay good so, so I, I wish to add one thing here and the question number one is that uh, usually literature would say about less than six months and cmn that's not the right answer if you are con including all patients till six months of age then the incidence of Wilms tumor and cmn becomes on, almost similar 50 yes sir so, so, so less than one year, as I mentioned, uh, up to 50% of the tumors are congenital mesoblastic nephroma and rapidly the incidence decreases. And at three months of age, actually only 10% of the total tumors are congenital mesoblastic nephroma. And as Professor Sarin has rightly mentioned, that at six months, actually the Wilms tumor surpasses uh, the congenital mesoblastic nephroma and other tumors. Okay, so let us come to the next question. 
Yeah, Dr. Depolina, please read it out. Which which one of these is the correct statement about pediatric dental tumors and gross examination of tumor specimen? Uh, arm and non variegated appearance of Wolf's tumor, hemorrhage or necrosis is rarely seen in Wolf's tumor. Fibrous lewd capsule in Wolf's tumor may be only feature differentiated with hypoplasty necrosis breast. Female and abdominal tumor of kidney have characteristic non equitative borders. Uh, answer is uh, C. Fibrous pseudocapsule in Wolf's tumor may be only featured to differentiate it from hypoplastic nephrogenic breast. Yes, good. So, uh, the Wilms tumor usually are soft and they are uh, variegated because of the presence of hemorrhage and necrosis. So, the first and two are ruled out. And regarding the congenital mesoblastic nephroma and rhabdoid tumor of kidneys, they have got infiltrative void borders. And that's why they do not form the pseudocapsule means this is that is why means when we are trying to differentiate a hyperplastic nephrogenic breast we have to have a interface of the normal renal tissue also in the specimen to de be definitely to be able to definitely say that whether this patient is having a Wilms tumor or a hyperplastic nephrogenic breast so yes the answer c is the correct yes sir. yes third question yes dr devolina Hello? All the following are correct statements about the history of English. Uh, yes. Hello? Yes. Am I audible? Please, please. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. All the following are correct statements about the histopathological examination of cystic renal tumor, except grossly identifiable solid nodules in the tumor are best classified as cystic wounds tumor. Uh, tumor devoid of solid nodules, but immature nephrogenic rest within the nozzle classified as cystic. Yes, the only cystic tumor containing only material cystic nephroma, CP tumor content. Um, uh, CP, uh, C, uh, cystic nephroma is uh, commonly associated with Dicer 1 mutation. So, answer will be D. Yes, good. So, uh, this is a very frequently asked questions by the examiner no, regarding the pure, uh, purely cystic uh, renal tumors. So we have got cystic partially differentiated nephroblastoma and the cystic Wilms tumor. And these are the characteristics by which we can differentiate. So uh, if uh, on a gross specimen, a solid tumor nodules are there, then it is a cystic Wilms tumor. While if we do the histopathological examination in the septa, we are able to find the immature elements then it becomes a cystic partially differentiated nephroblastoma. If only mature elements are there, then it is cystic nephroma. So the management point of view, cystic nephroma, cystic partially differentiated nephroblastoma, both either a partial nephrectomy or total nephrectomy, depending upon the involvement of the and whether its relationship with the vessels. So this is the, your answer is correct. Uh, the cystic nephroma actually is associated with Dicer 1 mutation. Good. Yes. yes. Dr. Debolina. What is the appropriate time to give radiotherapy in one's tumor as per COG protocol? Before tumor resection, if this will receive surgery within one week after surgery, within two weeks. Uh, answer will be, sir, within two weeks after surgery, nine to 14 days is a protocol. Yes, good. So this is the standard theoretical question only, but yes, it has got a great practical implications. One has to you know, be ready and prepared uh, and do all the logistics things so that to ensure that if you are following a COG protocol, you know, you are able to give the radiotherapy within two weeks after surgery. So yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, Dr. Debolina. A three-year-old child with left-sided Wilms tumor undergoes upfront resection of the tumor. The histopathology comes to favorable histology Wilms as per COG protocol, which one of this is an indication to give flank or whole abdominal radiotherapy to this child. Uh, Preoperative coronal biopsy. Uh, which one of these? Involvement of renal capsule by the tumor. Involvement of renal sinus by the tumor. Uh, large tumor extending across midline. Mm, uh, answer will be A, preoperative co-natal biopsy of the tumor. Yes, good. 
So uh, basically, we know that uh, the radiotherapy as per COG protocol is given in stage three Wilms tumor, and yes. uh, the involvement of renal capsule is stage two. Renal sinus vessels also is stage two. H2. And whether it is crossing the midline, not crossing the midline, it doesn't change the staging. So yes, yes. preoperative coronal biopsy, kind of biopsy has been done. Yes. So uh, the question which uh, means uh, Dr. Vikesh was, had also asked no, regarding if we have decided to give preoperative chemotherapy in one of a patient because if we think that it is not safe to remove the tumor uh, without causing any exactly. spill or without leaving any residue and if we decide to give preoperative chemotherapy and we are following a uh, no, COG protocol, then again we will have to give three drugs. So it becomes a stage three Wilms tumor as per COG. So we will give three drugs. We will give it for six weeks as per COG protocol, and then accordingly we will follow. Yes. Yeah, Doctor Devolina. As per COG protocol, which one of these is not considered for a stratification of unilateral Wilms tumor? Tumor weight, LVH at one p one q in favorable histology. Lung nodule response plus lung predominance. Um, uh, the tumor weight is also not used, and blastimal predominance is also not used. And so, uh, so, so what, what are those patients in which? So what you discussed, we discussed, actually, Professor Sarin has asked yes, you regarding yes, yes. Uh, so tumor, tumor, no? tumor weight is used. Uh, yeah. So blastimal predominance is the answer. Yes, good. But sir, uh, for favorable histology, it is 1P and 16Q, and gain of 1Q is used for all stages. So, so let us so uh, discuss B. about that also. See, 1P, yes, it is actually 1P 16Q. Yes, it is not 1Q. Uh, yes. So 1Q yes. gain is now being studied. It has been found that 1P and 16Q both are present in only 5% oh. of the patients. Mm -hmm. So that is why now 1Q gain is being studied and probably it will be included in the risk stratification. Of oh, both the protocols? Yes, sir. Yeah. Both the protocols. Yes, sir. So and regarding the blastimal predominance, this is for the SIO protocol means when we have it given the chemotherapy and then we look that whether, you know, the tumor is having more than one third of the more viable than tumor and then of that more than 66% or more than two thirds. But, but, but we don't use the word predominance. Dominant. There. The word yeah. type there. Yeah. So, right. so uh, means what is the difference means uh, in the COG, if suppose, you know, you do a pre-operative chemotherapy, this is this also again was discussed in between that if you do a pre-operative tumor biopsy, and then a blastimal, uh, you know, elements come. Uh, then will you consider that to be a high risk or not? This is probably one of the questions that was asked. So basically, it is after chemotherapy only because after chemotherapy, even then, a blastimal tumor elements are present that indicates the resistance to the chemotherapy because blastimal elements otherwise are considered to be very sensitive things, sensitive to chemotherapy. chemotherapy. So if if even if after giving therapy they are uh, persisting, it indicates that it is resistant to chemotherapy. So that is why we consider it to be as a yes. high risk. Yes, Dr. Devolina. Yes. Which one of this is not used for stratification of instrument and style? Stage, stage, histology. This one. Writing age, stage, histology, and responsiveness also used. Um, age. Age is used. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Answer is age. Yes, age. So, uh, you know, uh, we had already age. discussed regarding this stage, the histology, the responsiveness to initial chemotherapy. Age is used in COG. Yes, so, yes. if it is less than two years, less than 550 gram, yes, and then whether to give chemotherapy, stage one favorable histology tumor, we will not give chemotherapy. Yes, Dr. Devalana.
All of these are benefits of PSYOP approach of administering preoperative chemotherapy, except decreased intraoperative spill, assessment of in vivo chemosensitivity, yes, understaging and insight into inherent invasiveness and aggressiveness of tumor, early treatment of mechanism surgery. Uh, answer will be C. Yes. Because according. Yes. So, there so yes. No so answer. here we need to know the difference between understaging and to tell us what is that? Um, um, I don't think I'll be able to. So, so, okay. So, downstaging is the thing which is done when we are giving preoperative chemotherapy as per the SIO protocol. So, once we have given a preoperative chemotherapy, it has been found that up to 60% of the tumors are actually stage 1. So, we are downstaging. What the COG people say is, and they, they, are, they do argue that if you are giving this, you are actually downstaging these tumors. But when the comparison was done between the stage two uh, SIOP, stage one and two SIOP, and the stage one and two COG, there was no difference in the event-free survival and overall survival. So this was the rebuttal of the uh, SIOP. That is actually we are downstaging and then decreasing the need of radiotherapy instead of understaging them. And regarding the other aspect, insight into inherent invasiveness and aggressiveness of the tumor, this again is, uh, you know, achieved in the COG group instead of SIO. So the answer is correct, C. Yes. Dr. Debolina? A four-year-old well-preserved child presents with lump left lung with hematuria, epistaxis, multiple PTK over the body. Patient is febrile, active, alert, um, hemoglobin 8.2. He is bleeding time and epitity is abnormally elevated. Bitrate count is normal. CT abdomen, pole into four centimeter left and tumor and the upper pole. What is the most probable diagnosis? Tumor with acquired vulnerable disease. Yeah, so we had already discussed during the you know case discussion. So yes, the correct yeah. answer is acquired. So yeah. we uh, no in if uh, this was only the hematuria, then the IVC tumor thrombus was one of the you know differential, and because this patient is not having fever, so acute pyelonephritis is not possible. Again, the petechiae yeah. are unlikely to be in the patients yeah. with pyelonephritis. Danish dress syndrome also doesn't present like this. And if the sepsis was there, then other features of sepsis should also have been there. So the best answer is the acquired von Willebrand disease. And how so, do you diagnose that? I mean, yes. uh, Dr. Sareen asked this question and he said that I will we'll take it later. Well, somebody has already un answered <laughs> that. I'm the... asking her if she knows because she must not be looking at the chat box. Yes, Dr. Devolina. What test? Hello? What test? Hello? Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. So actually, I got disconnected from my laptop. Mm. Uh, now, now I'm also. Now I'm also. So, one so, second. So, one second. No problem. Take your time. It's okay. Okay. Huh. So, uh, how do you which one of the statements is correct? Okay. How do you diagnose uh, that one acquired one Willy Brand disease? That was the question. Mr. Sarin asked yeah, question when you were presenting your case and he said that I'll take it later. Restore test. Restore test. Hello? Oh, okay, okay. Fine. Hello? Yes, yes that is also one thing. And other things are that the bleeding time is elevated in these patients. The platelet counts yes, are normal. The platelet the time is raised. And the clinical presentation... Yes, and, uh, yeah. you know, okay. what is the best way to treat these patients intraoperatively, you know, when you go in and you find that the patient is bleeding from everywhere and you suspect this probably this patient so is a tired one. Only thing that is said to help is ligating the vessels. What is the, yes. what is the incidence Good. of VW? 8%, sir. Can you? Uh, 5 to 10%. Yeah, yeah. What, what is the incidence in India? 
Okay. It's close to nil. Trust me. It's close to nil. Never been reported. But 12%. I couldn't. No, it's 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 very uncommon. Hardly ever seen. I don't Zero think percent. that I have actually have not seen any case of one. I have not come across also. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it doesn't happen in India. Okay. That's it. So, That's it. So last question, yeah. Which or which one of the statements is correct? Pre chemotherapy stage of COG and post chemotherapy stage of SIOP have Equivalent clinical sequences. Um, okay. Prognostic factors of VIMS <clears throat> can be used interchangeably for SIOP and COG. Both approaches have almost similar outcome within pre and oral survival. Molecular markers are important. Sir, uh, answer will be C. Yes. Both approaches have got similar outcomes. Yes. So yes, both approaches are have equivalent outcome, and other things, uh, all of other things, actually we have discussed in other questions. So yes, you have answered all the questions. Good, uh, good job, and you are well prepared. Yes, over to you, Doctor Vikesh. Yeah. So a very nice session today, and one thing extraordinary about today's session that it crossed hundred figure for the first time, reached like one eighteen participants. Yeah, uh, and, uh, we uh, took over as president and secretary. Dr. Ramesh was constantly insisting on taking a Zoom subscription for more than 100 people. And everyone was like, uh, so much attendance is never there in webinars. But uh, I think uh, our, we made our president very happy today. Dr. Ramesh, would you like to say something? Yes, I'm really happy because so many people are coming forward and attending. And uh, we have a member of 2000 plus. And then uh, these sessions are not only for PGs, like how Dr. Sujay Pal has mentioned. Uh, you know, we are also learning every day. And uh, as the examiners put forth their questions, uh, we become students, basically. So not necessarily the students are only students. We are also students uh, when, when we attend the exams. And the exams are a quite nice way of putting forth uh, one's views and points and then bring up discussions. Uh, and it also gives you sometimes the surprise. Like, why did they not know that answer, you know? Um, so like that. So it, 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 it's quite interesting. And then now only this is becoming a popular session. And I'm sure even young consultants, senior consultants and many examiners are also joining today. Um, they're just joining out of the curiosity. Um, it's very good to know that so many people are joining. I only wish that the more and more PGs join, the secondary PGs and third year PGs and join. Uh, and then, um, uh, the number means we should easily cross 200 plus soon if it becomes popular. Thank you, Vikesh, uh, for arranging a wonderful session. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Now, before I put up my vote of thanks to everyone, uh, Dr. Sareen, I'll give you one minute. Please. Uh... Yeah, so I, I'll try to finish it within one minute or so. So the point is that uh, let's talk about MIS in Wim's tumor. It's very clearly written uh, by the umbrella protocol that if the tumor is small, then only you can remove MIS. But if tumor is small, less than 300 ml, anyway, ideally NSS should be done. And whenever you have a choice between doing NSS and um, MIS, you should always do NSS not MIS. So I see a lot of uh, papers being presented and papers being sent for me for review. People are doing MIS and large tumors and then uh, kind of, you know, opening it. Uh, that's not acceptable. And one more thing which I must mention, which is not mentioned in my textbooks even. Other textbooks obviously don't mention in my textbooks also doesn't mention. I mean, I should do it in the next edition. That is that if you're doing an open surgery, then also your incision should not, should not cross the midline, right? Because if a radiotherapy is to be given, they, they include the entire vertebra, but it's not. And suppose you want to do MIS, which I do not prescribe to, but if I have to do it, I should not put ports on the other side because once it comes to stage three, then the flank radiotherapy eventually, if you want to give, will become a whole abdominal radiotherapy, which is a big pain. Uh, whenever I've tried to do the ascitic uh, fluid um, uh, mac um, microscopy and found malignant cells and given whole abdominal uh, 
irradiation, even the best of centers where I've sent the radiotherapy, the patients, even whatever they said that we have tried to kind of shield the other kidney and all that, they have all gone into end stage renal disease within six months and died because they just couldn't get a renal transplant. So even if you want to do laparoscopy, I mean, ideally then learn to do a, how to do a retroperitonoscopy or whatever, or at least put the ports on one side. Don't cross the midline. I want to tell people if they wish to yeah. insist on doing a man So it's very interesting as well as thought-provoking uh, argument, sir. I really appreciate these uh, inputs at the end of the session. So now, just, just one, uh, you know, this was actually a very interesting, you know, the comment was pro by Professor Sareen, because actually the what is what we have read and whatever is described is that you should give a generous incision, it should ensure that, you know, the tumor is removed safely without any spill. Regarding not crossing the midline means I will be really, you know, uh, eager to know or get the reference from this uh, about this uh, statement that we should not never cross the midline, sir. I mean, you, sir, will, you, will, need to talk, you will need to talk to radiotherapist. I'll send you the reference also. I, I also agree with the comments made later. I mean, in Wilms tumor, we always make a big incision, not necessarily, you know, keeping to one side. So, so, so for large tumors, if you want to stick to the midline, what you need to do is you do the delivery technique. I mean, the pedicle last. The purists say that you should go for the pedicle first, but I've always in the last 10, 15 Many years of done the pedicles last. Many of us. Yeah. So this uh, discussion won't end here. It may continue in the academics group, I guess. And uh, really a very good session. Thank you very much, both the examiners, for giving your uh, valuable time to us. And especially Dr. Sareen, uh, for uh, joining with a, such a short notice. De Devolena, you have done an excellent job. And I guess uh, you, Dr. Sareen will agree that uh, he gives you d distinction for uh, this examination. Thank you, everyone. Uh, look forward to meeting you again the next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. I will be there for every session. I find this very, very interesting. So even next uh, urology session, I should be there. Yeah. Mani, thank you very much for your like uh, very nicely made quiz. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.